I'll welcome Raps Media Collective. Monica Narula, Jibesh Bakshi, and Shadabrata Sengupta from the Raps Media Collective uh, form one of the most polyphonous practices in our midst, initiated in 1992. As artists, curators, authors, thinkers, and mentors, many of us have witnessed the intensive flows and whirling of the dialogues and artistic environments that they set up. With a commitment to cultural infrastructure and its seepage into the everyday, formations of artistic solidarity, and the composing of an observatory where intellectual knowledge and kinetic contemplation in the form of art, performance, writing, curation, and the intersection of contemporary art, philosophical speculation, and historical inquiry may reside together. The members of Rux Media Collective live and work in Delhi. In 2001, as many of you know and would have participated in, they co-founded the Sarai program at CSDS and ran it for a decade and also edited the Sarai Reader series, which consider a continued, I think, inspire many of us today. They are the artistic directors of the Yokohama Triennale, and many of our questions today um, will also be prompts um, from this project. Um, and they were last with us um, for discussing the Shanghai Biennale. Um, also individually, they've been in dialogue with Curators Hub. So thank you very much and a warm welcome. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Natasha. Um, <laughs> so this is my personally my first hub. So I'm excited to be here virtually. I want to thank Prathik and Priyanka uh, who are holding the hub in spite of personal challenges. Um, and I look forward to the next few days of conversations. You've raised uh, some interesting points, Natasha, and I think they will get thickened and worked out um, with each of the conversations, I imagine. Um, so today, uh, what we are going to do, as you flagged the Yokohama Triennial, we are going to spend uh, most of our time sort of contouring that, uh, talking about some of the key concepts as well as the, uh, the uh, not only the exhibitionary, but also other aspects that we sort of worked with and worked through. But first, because this is, um, the hub is based in Calcutta, I want to begin with a Bengali concept, uh, a word that we sort of, um, I think unpacked for ourselves for the first time really in the in the last few months and the word is Antashira, which, uh, which frankly is quite untranslatable according to my two Bengali colleagues uh, and uncommon, except that it is found in specialized medical literature and a few obscure medical Bengali dictionaries um, where it is taken to mean intra intravenous. This is the link, uh, this is the sense in which we parse it to capture a shadow of the subterranean flavors and flows and forces that shape life. So today the world, um, as we have already said, needs to draw sustenance, inspiration and strength. But we propose that from the idea of, the, of Antoshira, the Antoshira forces in all of us and to engage in the remaking of the relationship between the microcosm of the embodied self and the macrocosm of the cosmos. Um, to make this slightly more, yeah. So with this concept um, as a kind of starting point, we are going to begin with episode 00, the first, uh, Monica, shall we say- screen. Monica, can you do full screen? Is it not full screen? It is. You're coming half of the screen. You're coming. Okay, that's. Hey. Achha, that's my, my setting. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, so um, as I was saying, so we have the concept of Antashira as a kind of uh, starting thought and a starting feeling. And here we're going to go into the episode of zero zero, which is, this is the, this is the building of the plot 48. This is the Yokohama Triennial, uh, this time, uh, not only took place in the Yokohama Museum of Art, which is where it happens every time, but it extended also like it does every time, but this time in this in, intriguing contraption of a building, which we uh, named plot 48. 
Um, this is going to be demolished, actually. This building uh, made around the same time as the Yokohama Museum actually is a, muse is a building without a future. Um, and in this, in this building, which has an interesting history of being uh, a place for a children's kind of um, Disneyland version, um, we decided to use um, a, a place in transition, still transforming from what it had been into what it might become, and staged episode zero zero. Um, I have been in this space where lots of screaming children were watching a magic show, but it is now transformed to host the event of episode zero zero. Um, I want to just read excerpts from the notes of that time, some of which we did, I think, uh, say that that evening, that afternoon as well. This was in November, 2019. We said, we've now been developing this idea of the episodo since February, but still need to find a poetic turn for the name. Episode expresses an event, space, or seriality, and we are looking for a shade in the word which conveys an awareness of another interval and passage of time within a constructed time. Episode 00 will be a first meeting with the press. So actually what happened was we decided to transform the press conference into the first sort of event of the Yokohama Triennial um, to sort of flag the, 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 ex the experience and expression of time that a triennial uh, marks. Uh, it is three years after all. And so this is, the, this is uh, in a sense, a metamorphosed press conference because it is a moment of an encounter. Uh, it happened over two days. So on one day it was a press conference in the sense that it was mostly the press that came. And on the second day, the, the event was kind of repeated uh, re-performed, I would say, uh, for the general public. So, it says, an introduction of ideas through works, performances, talks, and more forms. Uh, we will mark it with the luminous book to introduce the Triennale, which is the source book. More ideas for episodes are emerging. One is with the artist Masaru Iwai around a masking of toxicity as cleaning proceeds. Another relates to a tribute to the dead, remembering the dead that might otherwise be elided in the present historical tension with Japan, with the artist Nobuaku Takekawa. We welcome you all to the start of the Yokohama Triennale 2020, to episode 00. The Triennale commences one breath at a time, expressing itself in different languages, dialects, through translations and dialogue. It starts today, one of the thousand days between ad adjacent editions of the Triennale. For Yokohama 2020, we bring into consideration a portion of these days as a passage where many from all over the world will regard, scrutinize, and wonder upon the various impulses shaping this specific edition. So just a, a, another moment from that time, we said even that day, meanwhile in Delhi, five million incidents unfolds. The name five million incidents gestures temporal abundance. It is a sign of plenitude in ways of occupying and inhabiting time. It becomes a provocation to build structures that can last hours, days, years, an agenda of events, pop-up interventions, processes, gatherings, and conversations. Um, just uh, creating a momentary simultaneity to uh, sort of layer the experience of time. We will return to some of these ideas later. But first, um, as I said that we released the source book that day, uh, a luminous source book. And the source book, uh, I will talk about it more, but this is the first source. Uh, this is the uh, fragments of text by, written mm. by Kimitsu Nishikawa. Well, spoken by Kimitsu Nishikawa in conversation with the anthropologist Tom Gill. Uh, Nishikawa was um, a dock worker. He's passed away now, who, uh, who was also a philosopher. Uh, um, a, precari a precarious um, life he led. And it's an interesting sort of reworking, if you were to think of the relationship of the precariat and the autodidact, because he is a, a man who is reading voraciously, uh, who's uh, who's actually writing and thinking and talking and drinking. So he was a, a, a complex figure. Um, Jibush, you want to come in here talking about Nishikawa? Okay, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. Oh. So the idea was um, to, present the, to present our sources to um, 
when we had been working on an exhibition we had done recently before that in 2018, which was called In the Open Orange Tell, we had sort of become interested in the way, the method by which a certain set of ideas come together and asked ourselves to be more aware of that process. So we had made actually a scroll of sources which we had shared with the artists we had invited into that exhibition. For this one, we, we said, let us extend this idea. Let us make this available as sort of starting ideas, as uh, propositions and ways to think and um, to people the world, the thinking world with, uh, and make this available also to the general public. Um, so as we say in the book, source book, um, a mysterious effect of the meltdown of a nuclear reactor is a sensation of glowing light that can be experienced by human beings but cannot be seen in front of one's eyes. This glow, beautiful though it is, is also a marker of toxic radioactivity experienced as a vision. This ghostly spectral glow is said to have been experienced by people who worked in the Fukushima nuclear, reactor, nuclear plant in the aftermath of the nuclear accident. In our understanding, the toxicity of our time has been encountered with the cultivation of this spectral glow. Artists try to sense this luminosity, its beauty and its danger, so that we can see the meltdown that is happening around us all the time and teach ourselves how to survive and to thrive. We have to begin to think of life with toxicity and with the self-knowledge that banishment is an extreme cruelty and a profound folly. And as we said in that, uh, in that moment, what we are proposing is not a thematic uh, structure for the exhibition, nor a theme with a certain degree of contemporary urgencies. We propose a different way. We are putting forward a series of sources that would produce a space that is conceptual, affective, and open-ended, which would produce the architectonics of the whole journey within the exhibition, both for artists and the public. Unlike themes, which have a tendency to produce inclusion and exclusion, Sources enable the making of a non-rivalrous, egalitarian stance between various arcs, visions, and utterances, and allow for them to play infectiously with each other. Crucially, sources attract other sources, and, these, and they build itineraries of travel, of movement, of shifts in emphasis, of minor variations, and of major modulations. In today's very axial world, this makes for an open-ended field of interpretation and a collision of dispositions. So this is actually the uh, table of contents of the source book, and these are all our sources. This book is freely available to download. A um, Couple of things we wanted to flag. One was uh, the idea of luminosity, which I have already talked about, but also in, in the sense that Svetlana Boehm uh, speaks about it in her marvelous, uh, beautiful, uh, short essay on the idea of friendship, especially looking at uh, friendship between women. She says luminous, that luminous space where men and women come out of their origins and reflect each other's sparks is a space of humaneness and friendship that sheds light on the world of appearances we inhabit. In other words, friendship is not about having everything illuminated or obscured, but about conspiring and playing with shadows. Its goal is not enlightenment, but luminosity, not a quest for the blinding truth, but only for occasional lucidity and honesty. And I think this also sort of marks our own interest in thinking outside the ideas of enlightenment, of trying to understand the autodidactic impulse, of trying to understand what is it that um, emanates a glow but which lights up that which is around it and itself in unexpected ways. Uh, another um, source that is very sort of important perhaps to mention now is, is the Nujum al Ulum, a text from the 16th century, which I believe that the title can also be translated or read as knowledge for the care of friends. And in a sense, it is a recursive moment because the Nujum al Ulum actually. Uh, if you look at the, that table of contents, it's quite incredible because it has no hierarchies in terms of what is considered knowledge, what is considered, as, you know, well, astronomy, music, um, magic, uh, and also um, elephants, their deaths in a state of rot, their conditions and their diseases, as well as, you know, mystical journeys and meditation and ecstasies and miracles. Uh, these are also incredible drawings. I believe there are about 800 drawings in the original uh, text, which 
I will leave you all to discover for yourselves. Um, yeah. I want to now move on to the idea of uh, the deliberation and discursive justice. This is a strand that we sort of um, put into motion by inviting three uh, practitioners, uh, Lantian Shir, who's an artist, Gabelo Malazzi, a curator based in Johannesburg. Lantian is based in Dubai. And Michelle Wong, who's an archivist and a curator based in Hong Kong. And um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear. OK. Do you want? Do you, yeah, do you want to come in at this point? No, this is a Google search we just put because I was researching. And then we realized if I type discursive justice, the first is the classic essay by John Pro, and the second comes the deliberation of discursive justice by our brilliant team of uh, Lantian, Cabello, and uh, Michelle. The mo most important thing is that discursive justice is a very minor strand in legal theory, which deals with a very specific movement that happens where courtrooms becomes a site which, which kind of discursively presents and confronts justice as an idea being dispensed and also bring in different kind of historical memories or unaddressed, unattended sites. So, for, but Lantian uh, and uh, Michelle, so this is the episode of structure. So they, we, they start working in April 9, 2019, and over a period of time develop an incredible range of uh, uh, engagement with sites, with protagonists, with various kinds of forms of speech, with various sartorial schemes with various ideas of noise and music and over the period of time that this starts taking shape as events in different cities one is hong kong one is johannesburg so this is how our idea was that to disperse the triennale triennale is different from the exhibition so what happens is that we have been before our experience with other triennales we realized that there's a huge amount of time that goes into making of triennales and that needs a certain dispersal and certain attention to that time. That the time which we call the deliberative time, which then becomes the deliberation in this, that deliberative time is then brought into focus and by two axes, one is by dispersing it in space, you create a different idea of the triennale as not just being city centric, but in cities in dialogue with other cities. So you enhance that site, enhance and disperse it. And you know, as a, as a structure, the city structure, it is always the uh, idea of the triennale, the critique of the triennale has, has been, or biennale has been that it is city centric, it is city for tourism, it is city for enhancement, the cultural infrastructure. But by dispersing it, by making the deliberation much more between different cities all over the world, you creating a condition where the triennale could be read differently and the time that the triennale is in process of making becomes, and so discursive justice platform does that brilliantly over the period of uh, 18, 19 months and still continue. Uh, this so is, um, yeah. So here are the materials. The material is a house. It could be someone viewing. It could be the history of copper. It could be a fish, the story of a fish and a heron. So this, the, what happens is the idea of discourse and idea of justice is interrogated and expanded and teased out of many uh, realms, from the archaeological, from the geological, from the mythical, from actually the everyday stammer of life. Right. Um, so just to shift back. The milieus that emerge with the Triennale are an invitation to a migration of concerns, hibernating or urgent from distinct and diverse locations. They then stand refined and redrawn, suspended in co-presence. We commenced our own crossing leading to this vision of the Yukama Triennale about two years ago. I'm reading again from our notes with questions about care, about care with toxicity, about care and friendship, about luminosity within friendship, and about cosmologies of luminance. We shared these sources not only with the artists, but also the world in episode zero zero. Meanwhile, in the course of a few months, a tiny virus, an unliving being emerged, upending assumptions and assigning a task to the entire species. For the first time in human history, 
uh, we, all the billions from all parts of the world, have to undertake, and we have to undertake in awareness of each other, the remaking of forms of life. It has brought to the foreground the necessity of reapprehending the world. And for us, so this is part of the ways that we were thinking through um, what processes of, well, how does one go beyond the question of gaze and encounter to sort of relook at one's own experience of it. And so the question of reapprehending became um, uh, both a conceptual and a methodological kind of term even. And this is the work uh, of Ivana Franke, which is um, one of those pieces that is almost hard to uh, shoot because the experience of the piece actually, the entire, this is the Yokohama Museum of Art and the experience of the piece is that it completely jitters. So you, as you're looking at the building, it ceases to be this kind of uh, quite iconic and quite uh, you know, heavy and steadfast structure uh, into being something which is almost evanescent, which is kind of, uh, maybe you can feel it a little bit now. Um, it, the, the gaze, in, in the gaze, it seems to jitter and shake and, and lose its kind of solidity and becomes um, almost, uh, well, it, it becomes disappeared. Liquid. And this is, um, this is an... Why read for this? Because it's a dialogue. Right, this is a good point. Um, so I will read. A name holds so much within it. After all, it evokes scenarios. It conjures the known and the unknown. It draws affinities, it gestures to affections, and it has to travel in time. This was written in April, 2020. There is a distinction between luminosity of friendship, of radioactivity, of jellyfish and algae, and enlightenment or light from without. There is a question of how one looks at the category of light which is not just exteriority, there is a question of what comes in the porous zones of life and how it expresses, how it is retained in the sensation of thought. This is from an email. Dear Monica Jibesh and Shuddha, we have finally decided on the Japanese title. We had problem translating afterglow into Japanese, so we will stick with afterglow as title, but add a Japanese subtitle. Afterglow. Hikari no hahen wo tsukamairu. Hikari is light. Hahen is broken pieces or debris. Tsukamai, tsukamairu is seize or catch. And so this translates into English as afterglow, seizing, catching from the broken pieces, debris of light. How does one see the nuance within things that are seen as singular? Light is not black and white. It is not a binary of light and darkness, it is a spectrum. As mentioned in our previous conversations, we wanted to get away from the sentimental tone of the Japanese translation of Afterglow and look for a word that is more proactive, but with a notion of something that is not just bright, as in um, toxic. For that, we went through many phrases related to autodidactic luminosity and care that you are working with to arrive at this translation. This is from that email that Aki Hoashi wrote to us. You are never in one condition. One lives in multiple states at the same time. Not all of them appear illuminated together. Worlds continuously break, decay, dissipate, remake, contaminate, mutate, join. Radioactivity and radiance come to you with the same intensity. You can only keep the radiance if you care for the toxic. Luminosity is the awareness of that allurement and that danger. Sukamairu means to cease to catch, but in our phrase, we meant to simply learn from and understand. Broken debris of light comes from a reading of your text, sharing our sources in combination with looking at Ariane's visualization of the idea of spectrum. This is from another email from Aki. As we write in July 2020, the word afterglow came from trying to find ways to express the simultaneity and this range of spectrum condition of events. Light becomes more than something you are surrounded by. It can be an occasion to look at the infrastructure of life itself. You wanna add something, Jibesh? 
So, as uh, you all know, that uh, Yokohama Trainale was supposed to open in July. Uh, we were supposed Early to install July. from for July 2019. We were supposed for July, and we were supposed to be doing the. Uh, we were supposed to go and install, start installing from June, but lockdown happened. Everything was put to stop. So, the infrastructure of the museum and the shipping and, and Japan's lockdown was less gruesome than India and slowly slowly they were able to access shipping and a form of labor that could actually install but install with a certain delay because only few person could work at a time so okay after 14 days it did open but before but because of the lockdown and because of this lot of the discussion between the artists were very very interesting and what happened was that we produced two episodes, which was called episode X and episode 10. And this is why our the light model of the episode, the traveling episode, the episode that could gather new energies and keep on modifying itself became very uh, interesting. And new, new kind of work started getting produced. And uh, these are, and, and we produced, I think with, uh, with artists, I think about 25 to 30 new videos and forms of videos, performances and street acts were produced in the certain ease and gentleness over the period of three, uh, 30, uh, 30, about 30, 35, 40 days that it was quite a remarkable and gives us a suggestion of the coming infrastructure which we can discuss later on as the hub proceeds of the post-pandemic infrastructure of uh, the art world, the kind of assemblies, the kind of uh, uh, different ways in which uh, the modules of practice would be produced. But we'll connect it a little bit with this uh, section, which is uh, to a uh, thing that happened because of this work that we were doing there, uh, two, uh, two of our colleagues, Kaushal Sapre and Arushi Surana was advising us and thinking with us and researching us on the, inform on the uh, internet possibilities and digital platform. Uh, and this, this really, condensed into very interesting heightened practices that were seen in 5 million incidents where about a group of 40 artists produced an incredible range of for 10, 11 days of practices online and some of them were at 12 o'clock at night, some early morning, some going on for 36 hours, some going on for three days. So completely pushing the range of what the possible dis disjointed time and, dis and ability to connect. Uh, this two simultaneous uh, uh, logic was being played out. So this, again, we would like to discuss a little later. This is what we call the shifting infrastructure uh, that we wanted to just highlight before we move further into the uh, conceptual terrain of the YT. Uh, one thing, uh, Monica, I'll just say before you talk about Asako is that one of the things that we try to develop in YT was that through our artist conversation, which was extensive, to try to uh, kind of get influenced by the artist conversations, try to, like we were influenced by the source, our sources were influencing and working on, not influence in the masculine political sense of that you follow my ideas, but in the sense of a kind of porosity, a certain kind of porosity. And this, and this we realized was a certain idea de developed over a period of time, which we call the perimeter of the self which is that, uh, and you know, and uh, when we started researching in Japan, everybody started uh, the whole 
common critical common myth mythologies of every society has and like in japanese society was that it is inward looking going away and the more we started talking to artists we found many beautiful ways in which artists have a complex cartography and a kind of an extension by which the self is understood so this is one work by asako monica can you Yeah, so Asako, um, th- these she was the first artist four... we met. Yeah. yeah, she was the first artist we met. I'm just going to go through uh, three or four people whose work we could sort of just thinking aloud on the idea of the perimeter of the self and how that is constructed. Um, about Asako, starting from the late 1960s, a man travels between Japan and Sri Lanka, cultivating in his mind questions about food product production and crops, kinship and friendship. Between islands, his diary is filled with notes. The tides of his self ebb and flow to a faraway gravity. The civil war in Sri Lanka. The garden he tended grew a thicket. So I'm just reading fragments from the wall text which Shweta wrote, uh, just to sort of um, maybe we'd have to be a little bit faster, but just to sort of flag uh, ideas around upheaval and how those connect to the ideas of the of the constitution of the self. There was a set of works by Amol Patil. um and what it said about his work you breathe in air and toxins enter soil dust wind metal salt skin sulfur mercury breath they all reorder the world toxin the pollutant becomes part of life but remains undigestible people who work on this edge of living know its physicality they encounter its violence they grasp its difficulty and they confront the deep hardened cruelty of the of indic civilization that has no thought um on the threshold between life and toxicity other than banishment mutinous eyes assert this cannot last the ground shifts alongside a tape runs a conversation between a machine a siren and a mosquito the machine and siren come to the artist by recordings made by his father and inheritance from someone long gone the mosquito is of his time this is yuki uh, iwama yuki yama um her sister unhappiest of fairies for there is something in her heart she says that she does not like she does a dance plays the harmonica says a prayer when they go inhabit the world that she loves and in which she otherwise lives inside her head traveling outward with this luminous frame an experience of codependency that both deauthors and rescripts ideas of self and of loving in the everyday iyama finds it as well in the long time horizon of japan's history of mental illness in the records of asylums doctors tell her people of a different time too were creating and disrupting their own transcripts to understand her sister an artist decides she will try to understand everything about mental illness in all of japan Renuka Rajiv in portraits of intimacy of friendship of bonds of co-presence the togetherness of a world asserts builds resigns caresses it disjoins and then again resumes making its connections like embroidery on a quilt that wears down while giving warmth it is then and is then repaired once again these are paintings by Masahara Sato uh someone whom we met in the early days uh, of our travels in of going to yokohama uh, and we saw his last exhibition which was in a very small gallery in in tokyo he passed away soon after and his the last set of his paintings um are of these incredible as you can see intensities of color fields not only color fields but there is a relationship with color and and flatness of uh, of color that is uh, very moving these are um the keys to thaisi's replicas of the keys to his house or his family home in gaza to which they cannot go back uh, one of the other questions that we were grappling with is how do you attend to the world to attend implies a sense of attentiveness and also an exploration of capacity these are qualities that are present in everyone in different measure we know that both at the level of the quotidian but also at the level of the exceptional the measure may flick, may fluctuate from being very sparse to an overflow this is the work of rahima gambo um and as it says about her work 
overturning and overcoming that violence or mishap which impacts and defines life is an act of care between friends. It is self-learned and self-willed. It is exercised every day. Um, Rahima's work uh, is threading uh, moments in a school where there had been an, a, a, an event of extreme violence by the Boko Haram. Um, the other, it, so the, the, care, the care is also a struggle over questions. Will one concede to questions that explain away the habitat, its life and memory, or will there be questions that interlace and with which we co-think and dwell? So we initiated uh, many of our questions with, with queries of this kind, uh, and each and every one of them surprised us and gave us a kind of lateral spread. Um, to us, Naeem's film, uh, Those Who Do Not Drown in English, is about, in the translation of the title in English, is about the junction in which we enter an unknown place produced by a duration of care to allow a life to rest. What is the nature of this duration? How is the world stitched when the overwhelming sense is of drifting and breaking apart? The film stays in that zone with patience and elegance. It manages the difficult act of not dimming us to the future even as, even as it prepares us for it. Um, these are sculptures of Sartorisa, uh, figures in weight of embrace and care, different orders of um, figure making entirely from the last work. This is Rosa Baba's work. Um, and I just want to play a little video from a moment in our work, in a walkthrough that we did with all the artists uh, in, the, in, the, in the exhibition when we had a kind of, on the day of the opening, we did a, a walkthrough to the entire exhibition with Eric Hassan, who's the curator uh, at, um, at the museum, uh, for, and, and all the artists virtually present along with us. His, her senses installation, there is a large film projector, the 35 millimeter film looping this large looper this is Rosa Barba's work, Bending into Earth. Uh, this is, you know, you, we saw that archaeological dig and so there, there is a kind of a, this is a kind of the impossibility of the archaeology of the future. Uh, here, Rosa takes on an incredible toxic uh, kind of sites and radioactive sites and produces for us an incredibly poised image of that which cannot yield archaeological results. And if it yields, it will be threatening to us. And it is also, and it's also a, a kind of a reading and a, and a kind of critical unpacking of the language by which uh, modernity produces and talks about its own toxicity. Can you just stand here? Um, this, I, I, okay, uh, this is the work of Masaru. Yeah. So, do you want to say? The big picture. Uh, we met Masaru, just quickly, we met Masaru in the very early stages also. Masaru worked as a worker, artist, after Fukushima to clean the toxic, and he was someone who took us together. Cleaning the toxic is one of the most 
incredible thing because you actually hide the toxic. You cannot clean the toxic. But he, in the Yokohama Triennale, extended the idea that care is basically an act of cleaning. And cleaning is something that you do over an extensive period. It is perennial. So the persistent, it is not episodic. The persistence, it is persistent and perennial. And he, and he did this extensive, and now he has a whole team of people. So the mask that you see here is made, uh, it's a mask he handmade and with a graphite and then people personalized it. And it's with graphite, as you know, nuclear reactor, the idea of the graphite is to pre prevent the toxicity to flow out. So it produces a mask, push, makes it, rubs it with graphite, gives it to people who personalize it. And then they are in act of daily cleaning. And that, Monica, you have that full picture. Of, no. Yeah, I seem to have not put it not in my mistake. Okay. Okay, okay. Um, but if you go, if anyone can, if you go, if you go to Instagram and look for broom underscore stars, you will see literally hundreds of these moments uh, that people participated in. So we wrote one paragraph, which was, we remember Masaru, who described working with radioactive waste after 2011 tsunami, earthquake, and Fukushima nuclear collapse. To him, acts of cleaning are a curse share of being human on this earth and an acknowledgement of the fact that our lives are the afterlife of those who have gone before us. He has taken the act of cleaning to a rare place where it is able to both be poetic and analytical, gently pointing to the troubled histories of cleaning. And just, yeah, this is uh, a work that, uh, yeah, Monica. Just. Yeah, so this is, um, the episode was, uh, were both sorry, part. We need to go into Q&A urgently, I'm so sorry. Okay. To okay. wrap up, please. Okay, this is a work that is continuing. Yeah. No, for, uh, then let's wrap up. It's done. Okay. Why don't you ask the question, Natasha? Just so we have enough time because there'll be you know, questions and dialogue um, as important. So you've shared a lot of incredible practices with us. And um, the fact, of course, is that Yokohama, Triennale, um, and Afterglow was one of the first major um, exhibitions in, in Asia to convene this summer. And you shared a little bit about how you already kind of created a new um, temporality and experience, also a sense of continuum for the project. Um, but could you tell us a little bit more about um, the production process, how you continued conversations with artists um, from a distance in, in also what it meant to uh, have the virtual opening and some of us experienced that as well. If you could go into those aspects, that would be really good. We, we, one thing is that uh, in Japan, they have a very interesting history of cleaning and a very complex history of cleaning post Second World War. And Masaru has pointed out to us way before it's all started. So they, they, so they approach pandemic, uh, they didn't approach the pandemic the way the rest of the world approached it. So for, for us to have the conversation, and we, we in India, as you would know, we were, we were being faced with a melt, social meltdown that we have not witnessed in any part of our living. And I've lived quite a bit on this earth and I was astounded as to the complete criminality and banality which we were seeing around us. So between that and that, the only option for us was to keep on learning how to keep working and how, and frankly, all the artists from everywhere were extremely generous, cooperative, kept on dialoguing and, and they're very, very complex installation. Like Lantian's installation we couldn't show it was an automated uh, exoskeleton and it needed a lot of careful, but you know, there was, there were guides and there were, uh, kind of instruction manuals, there were continuous webinars, there were continuous uh, walkthrough through iPhones. So highly, but what we can say is that it's like a hologramic process. You're like inside a hologram as you are installing. So it's a very, I think that we have to all learn that in some form. And it is something that every culture will have a different way. Every culture has different instruction procedures. Every culture has a different way of approaching trust. And every artist is different in that way. So this first pandemic was fine because people were taken by surprise. But I think more and more protocols and habits will develop and it will uh, create its own ticket. And 
but uh, our experience has that way been unique and hope some conversation happens over a period of time in the art world about uh, how not to get uh, destabilized so much by these moments. This more, more such moments will come. In Japan, in the last 10 years, they have faced thrice these moments. So. Um, so let's see between you know, sharing about um, Shanghai Biennale, uh, where it felt as though um, the question of creating porous architectures and really bringing in a range of practitioners to ask questions um, and to see how the kind of reshaping of the, of the Biennale um, as method, as organ, could perhaps be instituted in a sense. And one heard a lot of artists who were extremely inspired by the experience of the Shanghai Biennale that you all worked on. Um, and also there was this aspect of bringing in interlocutors uh, as infra curatorial um, contributors. And I'm just wondering in terms of methods, you know, how would you perhaps set these two approaches in parallel? I would uh, see uh, Shanghai, the process, uh, the, if you look at Shanghai and Shanghai, last time I presented in detail, is that there is a 51 persona or infra curatorial. We were drawing various intelligence into Shanghai and, and into the Triennale structure, into the, that time period. So we were making it very in theory opera. So there was like around 250 to 300 people melling into it. So making it dense. So with Yokohama from the initial stage, we realized that the Triennale is a different temporal structure. It gives, uh, Biennale gives you a different temporal structure. Triennale gives you a different temporal structure. So we wanted to uh, gesture towards the possibility of thinking this temporal structure, the idea of the site, which is the Triennale is the site for the city, or the Yokohama, and also the idea of the time that it takes. So we approached it very differently. Uh, in terms of protagonists, in terms of number of protagonists that have uh, got merged and fused into the process in uh, Yokohama is as many as uh, uh, Shanghai, but in a much more dispersed and a much more de-authored, like it feels more de-authored. It is traveling. Like uh, said, the deli uh, our deliberation and discursive justice team did this incredible two days and nine to 9th October, 10th October, where they created a kind of assembly where from a say three hour long uh, historical philosophical exegesis from Santosh to a very, very sharp few, uh, few minutes of uh, theater crit critic, you know, theater, performative theater stuff, they could join about 25 protagonists together. So, so that the, the, the elasticity, and there were artists like uh, Elena who had, had worked with 45 in, our, in the site. So what, this, what we tried here was how to extend the deauthorial claim of the, see in Shanghai also it had a, but here it is more aware. It is more playing out and also temporarily and, uh, and uh, spatially dispersing the triennale. I would also like to flag the idea of the, the deliberative, which is something we sort of took on as a kind of start from pretty early on. And, uh, and sort of to, to, what is it that makes, what is the deliberation? How is that different from say a discussion or a conversation? And, and so to, it, it seems to, in all our com sort of common understanding, it holds uh, a certain tonality of speech and also a certain uh, temporality. And we wanted to bring that attitude in to how we were sort of, so it, um, it, this is an interesting question because it might also be have, might have been affected by Yokohama-ness of Yokohama. So I think like the kind of intensity of Shanghai, it was an interesting response to, uh, to think of, uh, of, the, of the braiding, especially through the imprecatorial or the theory opera that, that seized um, any notion of hierarchies and just sort of uh, offered you um, simultaneously many things to think through. Um, and this one was thinking much more in, in the deliberative register, I think. Great. We already have some questions, so um, I'll, I'll read them out um, and combine. How long did it take you to conceive and build the Yokohama, uh, Yokohama Triennale 
um, including mentioning timelines perhaps for performances and video. Uh, 720 for- days. Okay. <laughs> um, how did you select artists and artwork? Did you select existing works or initiate? There were several commissions, of course, as you said. Um, would you like to kind of mention more about the work with artists? I know some of them are long-term collaborators. See, the, it is very difficult to talk. Uh, artists are, first of all, invited. In a, one big difference is that they're invited. But it is, uh, like, take, for example, I'll give a good example. Since Naim may be known to some of the people in the Experimenter Hub, uh, Naim, we have been having, a, we know Naim for some time now, about 10, 15 years, seeing mostly all his work. But other than that, what uh, and this work is very much uh, a work that is very much different from what Naim has been doing otherwise. But this is also to know that Naim has been over a period of time dealing with the question of care with very intensely uh, and, and also transcontinental. It's a very complex stages of uh, understanding. So for us, we gave the sources to him and opened up our questions, the, the whole scenography of friendship, the whole question of liminal. And it is, and then he came up with a scenario and he kept on pursuing and he did the editing during the lockdown actually. Yeah. Uh, and that, so, so what happens is that you are actually curious about certain mm-hmm. uh, the journeys that people along with you are taking. So that is one way. And then there are people whom we don't know and who has uh, created. And I give one ex- example like Zhang Zhu Zhan who created a whole group of creatures which we couldn't show because the future will be either exoskeleton creatures or new creatures that will be imagined by us and will be terrifying us or will be very caught, uh, uh, will be very hobbies around us. So his, his work and Monica went to his studio and he was kind of, you know, it's a kind of makeshift thing with papers he's doing. So what it does is that it creates a possibility of imagining a huge world from a very, very uh, small microzone. So those become, you become curious, you invite, you, you want to carry on. And, you know, like most of the work that was new commissioned arrived at the Triennale uh, just before the show. So we hadn't seen them, seen them. It is only our conversation and the confidence of the sources and the confidence of the dialogue that we have been having with uh, people. And That's like my, yeah, yeah. If we can continue, sorry, there's just tons of questions and I'd love okay, to okay. ask you more. Um, you can ask us some questions and we'll... I'll do that. So, um, I also wanted to mention a little bit about, um, you know, 5 million incidents and the fact that the way it was a kind of propositional exercise, more peer-to-peer exchange and foregrounding a sense of intimacy. And perhaps just um, bringing that together with a question uh, from Shambhavi Singh who asks about the curatorial challenges when you work on big projects in India. I'm wondering if, in a sense, you could share from you know, this recent example of 5 million incidents, which is um, such a big exercise of uh, kind of collective timekeeping or disrupting time cycles, in a sense, if you could share. And I can perhaps uh, include then one more question, which is um, Shubham Biswas asks about the idea of, uh, he's quite intrigued by your idea of discursive justice and the way you touched upon it, but also shifting infrastructure, as you mentioned, the on, with the onset of the pandemic, which enabled artists to creatively interact in new ways. Um, and wondering about if you believe that the shifting in infrastructures of e-courts, legal offices could open new discursive justice environments at, at all, in your opinion, in India or elsewhere. See, the discursive justice part is that it is uh, more an exploration of not what is present as a court institution, but it is also the idea of the discourse, the discourse as present around us and the question of justice always present. So what they, what the discursive justice team, and you can look at very extensively, they have got incredible amount of writing and material because they're kind of trying to understand something very fundamental about how we bypass, we how formalize quickly discourse and justice. They, they are not opposing it with an informality versus formality. They, what they are opposing is in this formalization, what we are doing is we are abstracting away a huge kind of miasma of possibilities and potentiality by which people actually make discourse claims to justice. And that is what actually life is. 
so they're putting our focus into a new dust storm of life away from the organized little pots and kettles that we call justice now so that is one part that has to be dealt more seriously but the other part which you say about five million and the bigger thing and for me for we did sarai did the zero nine which was nine months and uh, unfortunately in in india we don't uh, we, we don't have a culture of uh, intellectual pickups you know where somebody else picks it up and says that look 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 can we take it from there so the conversation is very halted uh, it's up to, that's why we say antoshira is that it's very, we experience a more subterranean conversation which is global actually which is which is global and which is much more complicated trans global uh, but what has happened like with uh, 5 million we have an incredible host which is the gate institute so they did uh, allow uh, their build, uh, building to be to totally taken up we could dig holes everything and uh, they went with us uh, they went with the artists not with us so much with the artists trying out taking over the building taking over all spaces but that kind of uh, hospitality of institution that you say custodian in the beginning you know i think custodianship is something we need to understand more and more for in india rather than curation we should discourse more on custodianship we should get institution get institutions own way of handling 5 million as a custodian in debate and discussion rather than the curatorial aspect only because custodianship is what that change and one of the thing that we wanted to end this discussion was that when care and repair come as a dominant discourse which displaces productivity surely it will displace productivity as a meta discourse by which life is run you know when care and repair it will change the way we do art it will change the way we do care, curation already in our stuttering around us we can see that custodianship is finding a new valency we can see that care changes the way artists has to be imagined temporal dimension of exhibition may change so already we seeing this change which may change productivity logic of productive life to a more careful life and life to attend to 5 million is that 5 million was an attempt to do that thank you um Arani Bose asks, "How would you want Biennale to change in the post-pandemic world?" Um, and there's another question, which is about, um, you know, what you said about archaeology and sort of this um, impossibility to to uh, to picture a future um, archaeology. Um, then the threat drawn as a result. Can you spin something on the status of posterity? or inheritance and their banishments how many minutes you have five minutes okay monica no so that was Be i'm not i actually i kind of so uh, what would one expect from from the biennial as a as an event what would, what would, would one want to i mean this um the speculative nature of what you know the wish list is one direction of of conversation and it is it is an entertaining and productive because it of demands of you to you know imagine new things but i what we have also found interesting has been that when the parameters are given how does one then turn the soil within that and that has always been and so i think part of the reason that we gave like why is you know, the experience of doing uh, methodologies or or approaches in shanghai were different from yokohama part of what i said but it's also partly that when you have a certain amount of time and a certain idea of what potential or capacity can be then you try and find sort of methods and strategies in which you say what what are, and 5 million absolutely right each of these has been an attempt to say what is it that can be uncovered what is it that can be provoked what is it that can be deliberated on and and i think this is in a sense um i would say that we and we have said this that the biennial is is a, is a, still you know it it has value as an institution partly because it comes in a format or form that is still open right you can turn the soil of the of that i mean and we have worked in museum situations as well in a curatorial uh, kind of you know as as curating an exhibition and it is very different uh, because there are structures mm. in place and and there is so the question of how one looks at structure and infrastructure and how one can affect the idea of infrastructure itself that's what i think um is what we are interested in at this point of time and the biennial allows that so what more it can do i think that uh, that it depends on 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 all of us to to keep imagining 
And what are the other questions? Hmm. Inheritance. See that uh, this question of status. Time is up. Okay. So the, <laughs> the time is so you time. Yeah, we can pick up this conversation later. Answer, uh, this last part, if you want to, since we already posed the question. Which one? About the the impossibility of an archaeology of the future. See, it was it was very simple. The tox the way the toxic. Uh, is banished and produced and the way the toxic is not thought uh, what happens is that you may land up with a huge area of the unthought surrounded by unthought so, see in Indian civilization unthought has become the way we have started uh, we had gone and we are now started having a bravado about it that we have we didn't think we couldn't think the toxic oh we thought brilliantly but we couldn't think like that kind of thing but now what will happen globally we'll have that either you have the old world division earlier where the toxic is one part and the non-toxic with many of the uh, science, science fictions are or what the pandemic shows is that it's not possible so what the pandemic is that way is an it's not an epidemiological event it's an epistemological event uh, because epidemiologically, I could, uh, it is becoming a self-help more. You take care of yourself. But epistemologically, it is very much what it does is it breaks that old barrier, which Monica pointed out in a discussion earlier in another group. That old world barrier of division of the world is broken massively by the pandemic. So when you have US in the number one in the pandemic scale and you have, you know, like, and you have to read the whole world in terms of scale and you have actually cannot divide the world in earlier terms that was received idea, mm -hmm. our education we have received. So what we, what we see, and I see a question here also, cleaning and tokenism represented, those things will break down. Those forms are not possible anymore. So the representation will go away and we will have more infrastructural and dispositional questions. You know, so there is a big shift uh, and you can see it is happening. That's why it is going to be an epistemological shift. Thank you so much. Um, there are questions in the Q&A box which you can actually also answer as text um, through the session. We really appreciate uh, your words and for sharing from current experience. Thank you, Monica, Jibesh and Thank Shadda. you. Thank you, everyone.